I think that's an interesting part of the business. So we get asked a lot, how do you get into the business? I'm sure you guys do all the time. What mm -hmm. would you tell some young you know, couple or a young guy and his buddies that want to get involved into this space. What, what right. do you tell them? I get days? it almost weekly and, um, I should probably have just a canned email response or something, but this segment of DOD TV is brought to you by Leopold American to the core. What's up everybody. Welcome back to the jury outdoors. 100% wild podcast. We're powered by DeerCast. This is episode number 248. You're Tim Chelswick. You are... Wait a minute. It's not Mark. It's Ter not Terry. Tay Matt. Matt yes. Drury. Yep. We have a special guest today, Mitch Petrie from the Outdoor Channel. Mitch. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Thanks for being had. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that part of it, but yes. I'm excited to have you on because, of course, you're in town. Uh, you, we're having some meetings later on today, but I want to have you on the podcast and, and just kind of go over state of the industry and your thoughts on, you know, uh, the kind of content that's out there these days and how many places you can get content and, and some pretty good stuff, really. I mean, anybody with a camera nowadays can put together a, a hunt, it seems like, and uh, some some of it's really, really good and compelling. So uh, a, lot of of it, a lot of it, a lot of it is. <laughs> some of it isn't. And some of it isn't. But, you know, even that stuff, you know, can get get a lot of traction. So look forward yeah. to talking to you about all that in a, in a little bit here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. One of my favorite parts of my job, just you know, is mm -hmm. when I get to go visit our producers and see the setup and see the culture and that. And I would tell you that your setup here is pretty much what I expect it to be. It's pretty cool and pretty badass and um i'm just happy to be here yeah i appreciate that what and what's your official title at the at the network vice president of programming yeah so mitch is the guy that we deal with you know on a, on a you know daily basis when it comes to trying to figure out airings and scheduling and and, and all those types of things con contracts all that type of stuff mm -hmm. mitch is our, our go-to guy the guy he is the guy. He's lucky he didn't get kicked out of our parking lot. <laughs> by the neighbors? No, by us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a new uh, group move in next door, and uh, it's like a, a, a early childhood development. Uh, and I can't, I, I would, I can't wait to go into that building and see how many kids they got in there because there's about 200 cars, and they line the street, and you can't hardly get in and out of a parking lot at certain times of the day. So. Yeah, we've had to be enforcers of our own parking lot. <laughs> I Ubered in. I didn't take a spot today. <laughs> I'm surprised Good. that you could get in. Yeah, it's a problem, yeah. but it's our problem. That's no, why we no got Alan. Cares. Alan's our enforcer. He goes out there and grimaces at him. <laughs> That's all he needs yeah. to do. <laughs> Well, we should uh, we should welcome our newest Rack Pack members. If you're not part of the Rack Pack, what are you waiting for? It's free. It's on Facebook. It's fun. Tell Mitch how to get into the the Rack Pack. Because I'm not pack, a member yet. Pack. He I'm would surprised. be. You, you would like to be a Rack mm -hmm. Pack member. So you have to arm wrestle either Matt or myself. Tim. I'll take you. And win <clears throat> best two out of three. Done. Uh -huh. You got a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> all right. I'll take Matt. Yeah. <laughs> like um, but yeah, it's on Facebook. It's free, and uh, we post videos and like exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. Well, and a lot of it's it's becoming, which is what I think your intention, Tim, and in, in wanting to start this was. It's becoming its own little community inside there. It's just a, a private Facebook group, and uh, you just search Jury uh, Outdoors or 100% Rack Pack. Rack Pack, yeah. And uh, and then there's a couple questions to get answered to jump into it. But it's, it's pretty cool because what I like most about it, you see, like, for instance, Tim this week did a shout out, like, hey, where's everybody from? And it amazed me reading through there where everybody, I mean, it's across the country. People are from all over the place. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was neat to see that. And of course, people are leaving, you know, they're trapping pictures this time of year. I'm sure we're going to get into the shed hunting and their, their experiences yeah. outdoors. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, there's some good back and forth, you know, fun stuff mixed amongst, amongst the members. And yeah. it's just a cool little community. The original intent was to sell personal data oh. so I could harvest that from those idiots <laughs> and then find a way to monetize it. Shh. I've not got there. Well, they're not listening. Well, they'll we'll never know. We don't know how to monetize anything. <laughs> no, we don't. We give this podcast away for free. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a Patreon. We don't have anything. Like We're just giving it to anyone who will just listen. Just doing it. Yeah, that's right, because that's who we are. We're 
we're uh, magnanimous. <laughs> not in, in business, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not good businessmen. But we've got new Rack Pack members despite ourselves. They keep they keep joining. We've got over 650 members now. Nice. It's only been a couple months. That's uh, it's an exclusive little club. You know what's nice about the smaller communities? Because if you're in bigger groups, right, on yeah. social media and that. And then it's just start to get out of hand. And then it's like one of my favorite posts you've seen on some of those is like, you know, people argue about anything. So here's a picture of an orange. And then people yeah, just start going off. That's not an orange. It's a Mandarin. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's an apple. Wait a second. This guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, <laughs> so a nice small community is nice. You it, can, can is. you can kind of keep it civil and keep it. To, and it's all like minded. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and most of the folks in there kind of get our lack of sense of humor. So <laughs> just, it all you're going to get a good dose of here in a minute. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It works for, for now. For instance, these names, there's one fake. Tim always throws in a fake name here, and I got to figure it out on the fly. I got to also figure out how to pronounce it on the fly, mm -hmm. which is usually I can't read. So, all right, hold it. I no. can't read. Neither can Mark. So, all right. So we got Dylan Davis. We got Lewis Weiler. Dustin Wiseman. Oh, I know Dustin. We call him the Bean Guy. Uh, Randy Riggs. Bryant Bessel. Wee Woo Fitz Tink. <laughs> I think that's it. That might be the fake one. And Brandon Lowe. I'm going with Wee Woo <laughs> Fitz Tink. He's actually an Olympian. Um, he's in the, um, uh, the you, you uh, freestyle. He's the a freestyle, freestyle uh, skier. Ah, yeah. So we from woo. Portugal. From, oh, uh, yes. That's a classic Portuguese name. Yeah, strong Portuguese. We woo. Fitz Tink. How you is should Dustin start making these? You should start making these names more like names off of The Simpsons, where they call on the Moe's. Oh yeah, Amanda, Al, Amanda, alcoholic. Is there an alcoholic yeah, in the Amanda bar? Hug and kiss. Yeah. Amanda kiss and hug. Yes, yes. That's yeah. It. yeah. My fake uh, name, just so you know, is um, Jim Shikinjansky. Nice. Wait. It's complicated. It sounds well, like there's a swear in there. When I was in high school, he was a basketball player for the Minnesota Gophers. And so when someone ever needs like a fake name or something, <laughs> or they call it like, Who, who's that? Well, that's my buddy, Jim Shikinjansky or whatever. So he's like my random name. Nice. In Clearly conversation. It's too complex to be made up. Yeah, no, it's yeah. real. Call me Dragon. Rusty Shackelford. Here. You have to call me Dragon. Call me Dragon. I like that. Mine's Cat Fury. Not as interesting, but... No, that's cool, though. <laughs> Play off of Matt Drury, get it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. Well, I like that. <laughs> so Dustin is the bean guy? Yeah, so he, um, I believe the way the story goes, I, I feel like I was there the first time we met him, but we're at a Cardinal game, shocker, uh -huh. Mark, Terry, myself, and I, I feel like we had some guests. It might have been. Arizona Cardinals. Well, it might have been back in the day when, like, uh, we had dream season and we had the judges come in, so, like, okay. Bobby Cole or Scott Schultz or, you know, the guys, some of our partners, Blake Shelby, would come in, and we'd always, if it worked, it matched up, we'd take them to a Cardinal game. Mm. So, anyways, we were at a Cardinal game, and uh, we ran into Dustin, or Dustin noticed Mark and Terry and said hello. And of course, you know, Mark started diving into what you do. And once the, he said that, Tell me he, about your beans, boy. Where, where he worked, you know, and, and who he worked for, Mark and him struck up a, a good friendship. And he still he, he uh, helps us with our, our uh, farming purchases every okay. year. And yeah, huh. I mean, he's, he, he understands the science behind it and okay. helps the guys kind of maximize their yields. Hmm. See what I did there? <laughs> you used a word and then emphasized it. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's clear you know what you're talking about. So Yield. So please don't offer any follow-up questions, Tim. Huge. Huge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then Wayne Sanders, in response to our last show with Andy Barnes, the uh, conservation agent, he says, great show. Thanks. Hats off to Oklahoma Wildlife Department. They've been a huge help for me when I needed them. Fair and honest guys who are just down-to-earth people doing their job. Only one thing to remember, just hunt and fish legal, and you will have no problem. Like I said on the podcast, I feel like, you know, I said 99%. I think Andy said probably more like 95% of people are out there doing it that way. But it's mm -hmm. it's those, I, I feel like there's still some gotcha type of laws and, you know, regulations in the yeah. book that I think every, all 100% of us should be worried about. Because, I mean, I always have a question in my mind, like, am I doing this right? I think I am. I read the rules, uh, you know, making sure that I'm doing it right. But, mm -hmm. that, that you know, it's easy to say, hey, just hunt and fish legal and you'll have no problem but you always hear that saying if if they want to get you on something they'll get you they'll find something I, I have other advice for your listeners as well because i produced wardens for it's going on its awesome 11th show. or 12th season and yeah. we were for the first six years we were in montana and i was pretty active in that and the one thing i learned is never 
lie to the game warden no. ever mm. because <laughs> it, 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 they always figure it out. <laughs> and when they figure it out, and if you've been jerking them around, mm-hmm. they, they won't show leniency. And, then, and the game wardens in general have a lot of uh, flexibility in what they can or can't do. Yeah. Sure. And by starting it out, just being, you know, if, if you're deceiving them, they're like, yeah, that's it. I'm, you're going to get what yeah. I can give you, and here's the book, and it's like, it's that. And, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, I think, for law and for conservation oh, and enforcement. Job. But, um, yeah. Um, and we had in Montana, you know, I think there were 90 or so game wardens, and there was a cultural, a little bit of a battle going on there where they had the old school cowboys mm-hmm. and the younger law enforcement guys and the captains who were, um, you know, kind of in each of those camps. And the mm-hmm. and the younger guys were winning that culture war, you know, and they wanted to have computers in their trucks and they mm-hmm. wanted to be able to issue DWIs and do that. You know, sure. they wanted to be cops more than game wardens who were stewards of the resource and yeah. wildlife. Educators, yeah. yeah. And, and parts of their community, like they did their job by, by being active in their community mm-hmm. um, and going to rodeos and knowing everybody. Cause when you're a warden in Montana and you've got like 400 square miles, you can't be everywhere. Right. So you rely on, on people in that. So it, it's a, it's a tough job, but, um, but yes, definitely. Um, um, do not lie to the game warden. You told him your name was Jim Chicken Jansky. Jansky. Chicken, <laughs> Chicken, <laughs> Chicken Jansky. Didn't have an ID to back that up. <laughs> you know, Andy, the agent, he basically echoed that. He he said, "Hey, just be honest with us, and it goes a lot smoother." Mm-hmm. So, good advice. That warden show wasn't that like the top show in the network for the longest time. It, it was, you know, you can always finagle the numbers, yeah. uh, as you know, to, to tell different types of stories. But it did have very broad appeal, partly because um, the name. Yeah, if sure. If you're channel surfing, it's like wardens. All right, well, I'll watch that. And then the just the broad appeal, because even if you're not into like fly fishing, if they're doing fishing enforcement, mm-hmm. you know, you'd watch it and then you'd move on to something else. And there's just that element of, you know, looking in on somebody who's getting in trouble, <laughs> even though it was yep. the, the mission of the show was very different. And I think that's why Outdoor Channel was the right network for it. We weren't trying to create <laughs> general entertainment like mm-hmm. if you watched any you know um of the shows on discovery or nat Geo or whatever that had law enforcement in it they were manufacturing drama, drama yeah. and making yeah. some hunters look stupid and our goal was to show people actually doing you know enjoying the outdoors and mm-hmm. respecting it with the occasional hey you know um you know you know, here's a serial poacher and we're going to go and, and follow that, that story. Yeah. But for the most part, it, it was meant to be positive and you wanted to leave that episode. Uh, and then we would get hate mail from uh, locals in Montana. Quit sending people to Livingston, Montana. This is my backyard. And you don't pay taxes oh, here. You shouldn't yeah. be hunting here. It's like, okay. And yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of horror stories about uh, non-residents going into Montana huh. hunting and, you know, getting your tire slash at the trailhead. Mm. If you got a plate from Missouri or wherever, Jeez. but uh Everybody hates a non-resident. <laughs> it's pretty universal yeah. in every state. They like their money. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the, the yeah. departments you definitely like both. the money. Yeah. No, yeah. No. Unreal. No. Yeah. It's a short-sighted way to look at it, but I mean, I understand it in some respects for states that are like, you know, the, the big whitetail states, for instance, when people might be coming up and leasing a bunch of ground from out of state and, mm-hmm. you know, or, you know, I, I think... Whether it's right or wrong, I think people from the South might get a bad rap, you know, or the Northeast where they come into the Midwest and, you know, it's a different, they may not be used to seeing a 140 inch deer. So they see a 140 inch three year old, they're shooting Mm -hmm. it. So the locals get, you know, upset about that kind of thing. But hey, I mean, everybody to them. Anything good with the bad. You, if it it were me and that's the biggest deer I ever saw, you're never in a million years ever, ever going to pass that deer. (laughs) If you spent all that money to come up and travel up there and you got X amount of days to get it done, like you can't blame them. Right. Right. One thing I I didn't get to ask Andy last week and uh, maybe Mitch, I don't remember if if wardens did an episode with robo deer. Oh yeah. Multiple. I mean, th- th- those are fascinating yeah. to me. But I also Always wonder, like, shot. is that <laughs> is that entrapment? Like, like th- so, th- that's such a, a weird line for me. Yeah, it is. It would be considered entrapment. But what they generally do is, first of all, there was a big discussion before we ever put one on the air. Do they want to show this? Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, the wardens don't want to catch people. They would rather educate people and stop the bad behavior as much as they can. So sure. they were okay putting it on, showing how it happened, showing the reflective tape on the eye that looks like a deer when you're yeah. spotlighting it and that. But what they generally do, in, and we say it in the show, um, they'll set the decoy up in an area where to shoot it, you either have to shoot from the road or shoot before hours or not wearing blaze orange. Yeah. So they don't generally get you for shooting uh, that the animal it's it's up. yeah it's it's out of the you know out of the time it's not wearing blaze it's uh not because I, we had one decoy set up and one of the hunters crawled underneath the fence and it wasn't private property that's the other thing. Some, yeah. there could be trespass uh as another one um and so we filmed this person shoot the decoy and didn't get a ticket because they did it legally because you can road hunt in, in montana uh, no but uh, <laughs> but those that Dang it, son. it is funny though that when you get a ticket in montana that's from shooting the decoy there's a uh, decoy restoration fee on top of it it's like oh. 50 bucks oh, or something to to repair the <laughs> decoy <insult> to injury <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly so but that's how they do it so they're okay. not actually entrapping them. that makes they'll, me feel they'll, a little better they'll cite them the for breaking some other law okay no yeah. Those robo deer, I mean, they get shot a lot when they use them. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I it's it's just interesting to think that there's so many people out there. I think I saw an episode of that on. I thought it was Warden's. Maybe it was something else where it was a guy and his kid is in the truck or whatever, and it's like, man, you're teaching <laughs> you your kid it, this stuff like it's right. horrible. Or making the kid shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we've seen some gnarly stuff. So, <laughs> we'll, we would set up a decoy sting, and we would get shooters almost 100 percent of the time. But I heard a story, and I think it came from an old Outdoor Channel host, Jim Zumbo, oh, like yeah. in Wyoming, that this had some intersection. They put a they put a deer decoy out, and it got shot like 120 times in one weekend. Oh wow! <laughs> was, wow! Everybody yeah. shot. It's not a great Everybody shot. Like, yeah. The hunting yeah, community. Exactly. God. Yeah. Interesting. Well, <laughs> beware if you see a deer standing in a conspicuous place yeah. right. at the wrong time of day. Just follow the rules. Yes, yeah. follow the rules. It's yeah. fine. Know the rules. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's probably a good segue into some of the other, you know, shows that you guys, I mean, what's, you know, that sounds like maybe one of your favorites over the, how many years you've been there now? I mean, you've been there I, a long I, I was a producer for, you know, six or seven years, independent producer before I joined the network. Mm -hmm. And so I've been there for six years now. Yeah. Six or seven. Were you with Ron Shara? Ron Shara Productions yeah. up in Minneapolis. That's what I thought. It, I think that's yeah. the first time you and I maybe emailed Back Probably, yeah. yeah. So we were doing work for Outdoor Channel and some locals and did some production for History Channel back in the day and um, ended up um, doing, I was, Wardens was a show that I created with a partner uh, separate from Ron Shera and mm -hmm. ended up leaving there and uh, did some work with Polaris for a couple of years, working with uh, the TV sponsorships there and then came back to the network in an ad sales capacity and then uh, got brought in to run programming for sportsmen and ultimately took over outdoor and outdoor channel sportsman channel world fishing network and now my outdoor tv um so sounds really fancy it's actually pretty pretty straightforward but our business model is, is unique so yeah i've been there for seven years now this may i think so maybe explain to people at home you know why wh okay so when you watch a show on on one of these outdoor networks you know, it's, it may be heavy with, you know, in show content that's very sponsor driven. Mm -hmm. Kind of explain the, the process of how this works, how a producer goes about getting a show on, on one of these networks. Sure. You know, and, and it, uh, as the business model has evolved and as technology has evolved, it's changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, 25 years ago, I think is when Outdoor Channel was founded. And it was the original founders had um, they were. Um, they panned for gold and they filmed a lot of it. And so they started at gold fever was one of the fir first gold shows. On the, and that show did really well in it the did. ratings all the time. <laughs> Crazy. They just, yeah, they, exactly. <laughs> Wasn't they were, much production to it. <laughs> no, they just panned for gold and told, you know, and they're, they're interesting characters. And that's a, the Massey family. Yeah. Yep. So they founded outdoor channel. They brought in some professional management for, from ESPN type background, mm -hmm. real professional backgrounds and created this premium platform that was outdoor channel where we negotiated distribution on all the major affiliates, the DirecTVs, Dish, Comcast, what have you, and then would go to independent producers and say, you want an audience for your DVDs back at the time? That's yeah. the jury DVDs were selling in VHS yep. tapes. So we then brought this, um, this television network 
dedicated to this lifestyle. There was other, there were other networks like TNT and uh, ESPN, or then ESPN two came yeah. out that had uh, outdoor programming. ESPN had a fishing block, which was really my first TNN experience. TNN had and back in the day the national that was network. the place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Real Tree Outdoors, Gray, uh, Jay Buck Gregory, Masters. yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Buck Masters. Those shows were like foundational yeah, in Tom this Miranda, space. Those guys, yeah, and then they kind of they kind of moved as the technology shifted and the Men's Outdoor Network. Remember that for yeah. lunchtime that yeah. showed mm-hmm. up and then that disappeared. Maybe even before it started, I don't know if it ran out of business, but so Outdoor Channel filled that void and it was the first 24 seven hunt shoot uh, fish network. And uh, yeah, so we focused on the distribution and then would go to producer partners and say, you want to reach an audience pre YouTube and the internet and that here's a built in audience that we're going to maintain and build yeah. for you. So, so the producer would just buy time from the network. We would split some of the commercial inventory. The producer gets commercial inventory and that's where they would go to advertisers and say, Hey, Matthews, would you like to sponsor my show? Mm. I'm out, you know, killing big deer and you know, we can help promote. And it, it's one thing that I, I know we get complaints from viewers that our content tends to be over overly commercialized, yeah. it, you know, and it's not every single show that way. There's also a large percentage of viewers who accept that because, hey, they're looking to you as the expert to help them understand. And mm-hmm. like we've got great data about how our viewers actually watch our commercials on our network because it's almost part of the editorial content. Yeah. It's like, OK, they're using, you know, these blinds. I'm going to do uh, I'm going to go and um, I trust you guys. I like seeing the commercial and I'll watch it. So that's kind of the, the nature of the how the networks got started. I, I find it uh, interesting um, it, when you look at it and you say like the modern way, the modern media, if so online media, YouTube, you know, you do, doing it on your own channels are even, you know, social media, say meme pages are, are, you know, some of these satire accounts, you know, and they ding up the network and, and it, it, you know, I think it's a, popular thing to say, oh, I don't follow anything that, you know, somebody tries selling me. I, th- I can think on my own. And the reality of it is it's cool to say that. It's cool to think that. But the reality of it is there are a lot of people out there that utilize what they see on these networks and they put those practices into place or they buy these products because they're seeing them in use. And I don't think anybody's naive to think that that person isn't thinking for themselves and it's just like, Oh, I'm mindlessly, whatever I see, Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy. I don't think that's the case at all with this viewer. Right. But I do think they really focus in on what are some of these people that are successful that I believe that are authentic right. in the space. What are they using or what tactics do they use and how do they succeed and then go put these into place. And we've seen it for 33 years now. That's what our user that's the type of content they want from us. We have shows that are inter- more entertainment than educational, like a critical mass I would put under that umbrella. Natural born I'd put under that umbrella. But <clears throat> we're still trying to teach them stuff along the way. But you look at 13, you look at Bull Madness, where they're really diving into the weeds on mm-hmm. how they're succeeding. And, I mean, we've that's kind of the bread and butter of what Mark and Terry have done for 30-something years with their VHS and then their DVDs and then the TV shows. And so I, th- I think they're there's plenty of people out there in the audience that looks at the content and says, okay, these guys can back up what they're saying. I I do trust in what they're saying. It's not just a gimmick. Have there been gimmicky types of products along the way? Yeah. I mean, it's, there's plenty of them. I think you, as the viewer have to sift through that and decide what you feel like is, Mm -hmm. is real and really constructive in helping you and what might be somebody, you know, saying, you know, yeah, this is the best I've ever used. Right. Now, the other thing about the best that I've ever used, that evolves through time. I mean, you you know, think of the difference of trail camera technology from 10 years ago versus today and, you know, new companies that come out. I mean, it's, it's constantly evolving. So I think you have to allow the producer a little bit of leeway in that context that products evolve the industry's evolving and their opinion may be evolving on what they feel like really helps them. A big challenge for me in talking about our business as a whole with producers is that we have producers who are, 
startup mom and pop or startup young guys, you know, doing whatever, all the way up to, you know, the Drury's who are at the, at the top. And I'm not just pandering because I'm sitting here and you're going to buy me lunch, I hope, at some point. <laughs> yeah, we've or already dinner. had lunch, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, viewers will say, yeah, well, he's only schlepping that product because they're paying him to do it. Yeah. And, and of course, there's some truth in some respects with some producers to mm-hmm. that. But, you know, consumers can smell the cell, right? Yeah. But the Drury's have a long-term relationship across all your platforms with your audiences and have a lot of leeway. And, and most of your viewers understand that hey, businesses change. Yeah. And businesses, and not every partner that you have who you believe in, who you've worked hard for, and I'm not going to name names, but they don't make it. Yeah. You've outlived some of those, yeah. you've outgrown those relationships. That doesn't mean that you were just in it for the money or doing whatever, but you are mm-hmm. a marketing partner on them and you believed in the product. And I think you've established that trust over decades yeah. that you're not going to take a BS deal just, just for the money. And so people generally, genuinely trust the Drury's because mm-hmm. you back it up on camera yeah. across all your shows. Yeah. So. I think that's an interesting point too, because the, you know, we've had big changes. We've had the bow, big bow change, a big, you know, a couple of apparel changes through the year. Moss Yoke's always been the staple, but there's the, there are parts of the business you cannot help. You know what I mean? And it's, right. it's, it's not about jumping ship for a bigger check. It's about sometimes the, as you say, you outgrow a relationship and they no longer see the value in what you're doing are you just outgrown what they can, they can do with you. And, um, it, it's, it's almost always it's, it's on good terms. It's just like, Hey, it's just not working out anymore. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to make, I mean, we cringe to think about making a change for a lot of reasons, you know, the, the one just thinking about the our, the size of our team and like an apparel change is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we've sure. had a couple of those over the last say six to 10 years and it's a nightmare. We, I mean, I'd rather we, we, and we've done this before, take lesser deals to, to stay with the partner we got or, you know, it's just not something you want to do, mm-hmm. but sometimes mm-hmm. you're for your hand is forced. And at the end of the day, we do have a business, you know, and a lot of overhead as you talk about the building and all the employees that sit in these seats, you know, plus you got Mark's got a bunch of employees at his place and Terry's mm-hmm. got an employee and you know what I mean? Like it's a sprawling company and ultimately it has to make financial sense too. And I think a misnomer would be uh, that, Everybody in the industry is just, hey, man, I wish I could do this for a living. You get paid to do what get you paid love. paid to hunt. It's just it's, not that, some really. people get paid that work here? Oh, sorry, Tim. Nobody not, for, talk, not, Tim for, not for podcasts. Can we talk later? <laughs> yeah. Podcasts are free. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I, I think that's an interesting part of the business. So we get asked a lot, how do you get into the business? I'm sure you guys do all the time. What mm. would you tell some young you know, couple or a young guy and his buddies that want to get involved into this space. What, what right. do you tell them? I get days? it almost weekly and, um, I should probably have just a canned email response or something. But first of all, I'm always impressed with young people who are in touch with what they really want to do long-term. Mm-hmm. Cause I, when I graduated college, I just wanted to make a lot of money and didn't really care what I was doing. And I kind of fell into this business, which I love. I wish I would have started when I was 20, 25, not 35. You're or, an avid outdoorsman. Yes, I have been my entire life. Live in Minnesota. Um, I've always been you know, Minnesota. I, I filmed a video the other day, I'll share with you, where I actually caught my, I was like, wow, yep. that was it like totally, up. totally Fargo. I was like, <laughs> and I, you even, I, even I thought of that. But um, so, yeah, I, I always tell these kids when they're, their interest is, you know, if they ask, if they, you know, no one gets paid to hunt. Michael Waddell mm-hmm. doesn't get paid to hunt. The juries don't get paid to hunt. You get paid to create content, to promote partners and sponsors and help, yep. help move product. That's kind of what, you know, the sale, everything starts with the sale, right? So, um, so I said, so get rid of that dream that people are just going to want to watch you because and most people, myself included, I'm sure think they're more entertaining than they actually are, or they have a concept that is educational and entertaining. Never been done before. Never been, wow. yeah, it's like, no, you Entertainment. Know, yeah. So, um, and the barrier to entry you mentioned earlier about, you know, anybody who has a, a cell phone now or whatever they can, they can used to be the barrier entry was pretty low, but to get it to the air was a lot harder. Well, now mm-hmm. my son is my poor kid. He's 18 now. He's got a YouTube channel. He's got like seven followers, but everybody has got their own yeah. YouTube channel. But, and most of them are creating decent content. Yeah. So to get to that, to the top is 
is a little bit like when you see you have sports memorabilia in your office. It's a little bit like making it to the big leagues yeah. because there's a lot of decisions along the way about your brand, about your content, about your story, about your position, about what you're willing to do mm-hmm. for a sponsor and, and those decisions. And so it's, it's really hard. So my advice is always to, um, depending on how young they are, is like, yeah, I would go to work at a retailer outdoor retailer. Mm. I would get, you know, if you're in college and you're going to work through college, I'd say my kid was at North Dakota. I'm like, man, get a job at Shields. So I don't want to work in a retailer. I do learn how the products are bought, displayed, Mm -hmm. sell through, understand that side of that business. Understand the products themselves. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Not just because everybody loves to hunt and fish. That doesn't make you new. Everybody should love to hunt and fish. Yeah. A lot of people. But everybody who contacts me for ideas on work, they all want to live the the dream in this lifestyle. But the reality is to be of value to people, you have to understand the business and, and bring something. And yeah. that's why I, so I, I recommend they work at a Cabela's, work at a, a Shields or yeah. an Academy Sports, wherever, yeah. and understand that side of it. Because if I'm, when you're graduating, my son just graduated from University of North Dakota, I'm like, you know, two million kids a year graduate from college. And you want to get into this space, what sets you apart? Well, here's a kid who for four years worked in the, at the archery desk. You know, he understands how to tune a bow. He understands mm-hmm. all the components and I'm selling strings. So I might be more interested in that. Yeah. Kid. yeah. Be yeah. of service. That's one of my favorite phrases. You got to, you, mm-hmm. you can't be about you. It's got to be, how can you be of service to someone else? We, we need more of that because that's, oh, I don't want to go political, but that's what yeah. drives me absolutely nuts is uh, when you just see, it's like everybody's in it for themselves. It's like, yeah, man, yeah. We've, we've got to. We've got to suck it up and you know work towards a greater good and serve the community and serve yeah. instead of just serving your own needs. And that's a maybe this pandemic, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, that's a positive thing that come out of it. People are Hopefully. like, yeah, doing a little less, yeah. uh, a little more introspection and doing more for the greater good. When you talk about young people and and uh, you know having a, sh- a want or need to have a show or they have these YouTube channels, th- there's some great products out there on YouTube. Uh, you know the hunting public guys or you know Seek One or th- there's all these different Midwest whitetails. You know the, some fantastic content out there. Uh, what have have you guys ever? approached those types of producers, not, you know, not to name any specific name on your side, sure. but have you approached someone like that and said, Hey, love the content. Would you like to step up and do it on a more of a, you know, on a different scale or a different level? I don't know how many questions were there, but the answer was yes to all of them. And I can give you some specific examples. And I think in general, I think that's coming around now mm-hmm. because um, if I were to talk to a random YouTuber who's making 10 grand a month on views on the YouTube, by the way, there's not a hundred of them, right? There's not a thousand no. of them. There's Handful. a few, again, just even there to build an audience, you know, you're doing a podcast. I've done a podcast to build that, that following that audience takes a lot of time. Joe yeah. Rogan took him 12 years yeah. to, you know, to become mm-hmm. Joe Rogan. So and cancelable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And still, yeah. Under pressure. It, it's a, it's a battle every day, even, yeah. even at that level. So, um, we've had, um, I've had conversations and the, the thought of them buying time for distribution doesn't make sense. But what might come around is, okay, once you've kind of, you know, there's, a, there's a maximum number, I think, mm-hmm. that people are experiencing. You know, the, these guys who are like, oh, I, I went from, who was it, the uh, fishing guys uh, that my kids love. Oh, um, um, I follow them on Instagram. God right, John B. Fishing. The go- go- John B. Oh, the Googan Googan Squad. Squad. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, at, at one point, they're like, well, you know, I'm growing. We're getting a million new followers a month or what? It's like that That kind of planes out. Off, yeah. yeah, and then they would be like, okay, where? how could we do it? You know, maybe that traditional model, like we might not convince them to pay yeah. $10,000 a month for the distribution, but there might be an opportunity there. Yeah. We did uh, specifically do a show with uh, Jorg from Weapons by Jorg, which is a mm. YouTube show, yep. massive yeah. following, massive, a German cool. guy. So we did a show on Outdoor Channel, and it's called Backyard Ballistics, and did a bit of a test on that to say, okay, this guy has 3 million plus subscribers. How can, how does that translate to viewers on our network? But there's so many variables. It's like, well, if the show's not good, the show was good, but if the show's not good, that's going to impact your audience. Um, He has a global following because he's a German guy. So not all of his audience is in the U.S. So what percentage of that is going to go? And then even if you are a Jorg fan, are you going to consume 
TV traditionally, even though that's also shifted, right? Um, you don't have to spend 200 bucks on a cable package anymore to get our networks. Mm -hmm. You can buy them for 10 bucks a month on, you Sunday know, for an app TV and or whatever. Yeah, different app services and that. So, so, um, and we do have research in our company, but it's, it's really hard, um, to identify like very specific drivers. But I would tell you that, um, there will be a day as things kind of flatten out where it will make sense for a YouTuber to yeah. try to reach. So we, we're doing a show with Andrew Zimmern who had bizarre foods on, <laughs> on, um, yeah. on food network yeah. and, uh, is on Magnolia now with a show called uh, family dinner. And, uh, I got to know, I took him fishing and he's, he's a brilliant guy. Just like, you can't travel to like every continent yeah, on yeah, the planet sure. and, sure. and, and not be smart. I mean, he yeah. just soaks up all that. Stuff. So, um, you know, and he makes a lot of money on the networks that he's working for and has worked for. And we convinced him to do a smaller deal because our distribution is smaller. Our audience is smaller, but it's mm -hmm. complementary yeah. to uh, where he's at. Sure. And so he's come in and um, Joe Mantegna did that with yep. Gun Stories, an outdoor mm -hmm. channel. And Arlie Ermey, uh, rest in peace, uh, yep. did that on um, on his show as well. So uh, Gunny Time. Um because it is, it is different. So I think you'll see where a YouTuber, uh, you know, a black tip H black tip. How does that, you know, is it black tip, mm -hmm. black tip? Is it black tip H? I don't know. Black tip. It's the H silent. There's so many different YouTubers anyway, black, yeah. with cool names. You know, yeah. Those, you know, those guys, they, you're exactly, they take a shit and it's green and they post it and it's like, Oh my God, this is amazing. This yeah. is the best green shit I've ever seen. Yeah. 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 It's like, okay, well, they're always green, right? Yeah. That stuff might come out. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> what kind of supplements do you take? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Told you he was into it. <laughs> yes. No. So I, I, it will, it will be interesting. And I, I think that's one theme with our network as well. We've been around for 25 years. We own print magazines, right? And print magazines, the joy have been dead for 15 years. And yeah. We've had some of our best years ever and out, you know, outlasted a lot of the traditional magazines because there's still an audience that wants to pick up a magazine. Yeah. They buy it at mm -hmm. a newsstand. They want to subscribe. They're changing. You know, like there are people who they'll complain about a $10 subscription to in Fisherman magazine, but they'll buy a $20 fishing book, special perp, you know, special, um, uh, magazine that will do 20 bucks with a harder, with a, yeah. a higher quality cover. Yeah. They'll be like, Oh, $20 nice. for my, for our elk. The coffee table. Yeah, That's exactly. It. But I won't spend $20 on a, on 10, uh, yeah. magazines, but there's, there's some that will. And, like the digital magazine thing just never really happened. It did but, never really take off. Right. But, but our networks, um, we're not the fastest and the most nimble because we have a big and complicated business with magazines and websites and, um, you know, the, and the networks that we yeah. run in that. The app. Um, yeah, and, and the MO, My Outdoor TV app. Um, but when we come around, um, yeah, we, we have the longevity. So I, I think that's, you'll see us um, – when YouTubers come around, we'll be there with a solution to mm -hmm. that challenge. And, and there's, you know, there's kind of this pay to play scenario where we're buying airtime as a producer. That's the scenario we've always been in. But there there are things that the network will um, green light, so to speak, and and programs that you guys produce and, and hire producers to do. King right. of the Spring was one of them right. back Wardens, in the day. Yeah. Wardens, yeah. So King of the Spring was just one season, but that was a project that we pitched to the network and, and Jeff Wayne at the time. Yeah, before uh, my time, I would have never, I would never approve that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> too, too many shenanigans in it. But Jeff Wayne at the time, you know, mm -hmm. he, he decided to kind of take a risk on it and it did great for a couple months, but it just didn't, you know, the way that, that the network runs it's first, second quarter or third and fourth quarter or 52, mm -hmm. you know, weeks it was, you didn't have the flexibility to say at the time anyways, to say, okay, we're just going to run this from April, like end of March through the beginning of May when it right. made sense to run, right. you know, in that period ratings were great, but in the other periods <laughs> for the first and second quarter, not as good. Right. But now you look at it, it's over on MOTV and you know, Sean over at MOTV always talks about how great it does. Right. During one, that one season that's been running for <laughs> nine years now yeah. still rates well. Like so. one of the top rated things on the app in mm -hmm. that, you know, month, two month time right. frame of turkey season. And so anyways, th there's, there are different things that you can do on the network. I mean, you can pitch something and, but boy, it's gotta be good. It's gotta be different. It, it's gotta make financial sense mm -hmm. for the network to be able to go sell the spots and, and, and make their investment back. So sure. more often than not, when someone asks me a question about, you know, why would we be doing this, that, or the other thing, whatever it is, there's usually a reason. And it's usually because 
you know, of our longevity and our distribution and related, we, we don't have a lot of flexibility uh, based on the model that we have, but the model is evolving. So it's, it's, it can be a painful process, but uh, we didn't at the time, uh, and that was before my time, but seven, eight years ago when uh, that, so, and I'm, 2012, a tur- I think, I'm a, 11, I'm a turkey hunter. So I was a producer at the time. I just wasn't working for the network yeah. full time. Um, you know, turkey hunting doesn't rate that well on yeah. the network. Uh, yeah. The joke, you know, they all end the same way with the turkey yeah. getting shot in the they face. They all look the same. I love it. I, I enjoy watching. I enjoy uh, the, you know, the turkey episodes and that. But um, yeah, King of the Spring was a risk because most of our investments in programming are in, in shows that don't don't really fit that time by model where yeah. mm-hmm. there's not going to be enough sponsor support to, to put the money in. And, and it's, you know, everyone said, well, it's always about the money. Well, it's not always about the money, but we do want our producers to have the ability to generate enough revenue to invest in the yeah. facilities and the yeah. programming and, and the quality, um, and also in, you know, in your employees and, and maybe eventually have a retirement out of this yeah. or a transition to, you know, to something else. Um, so it's, um, that was one of the early ones where, um, it was the first time we'd ever put money into a endemic hunting show. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was very, I still remember it. Like I, I haven't watched it for a long time, but yeah. I remember one of the episodes, I think it was Mark might have, but probably he in, killed the, most in of the ditch, <laughs> in the ditch. That was and, me. Yeah. That's okay. That's why I, I was, yeah. I should have just said hey. it was you, but I remember that hey, episode, gotta win. but that's, that's cool. But I've been yeah. there, you know, you're, you're creeping it. I yeah. love that kind of turkey hunting. So, so yeah, so that, that it didn't perform very well um, on the network and it had nothing to do with the airtime, which can affect it or program. the quality of the program, the entertainment value. It's just, we have a seasonal drop Mm -hmm. in our viewership. Our viewers watch more when they're participating and January, February, March is when that, it starts to pair off and people start thinking about getting outdoors, fishing and that. Um, So then we, uh, we, yeah, when we launched MOTV and then gotten kind of a lot smarter about marketing the programming, because it's Mm -hmm. a different, different opportunity, create a turkey hunting stunt, put King of the Spring in there. One of the top rated shows on the platform. It was Right fun. time, right place. And we, yeah. I mean, to this day, we still get, that was, I think it aired in 2012. We still get all kinds of emails about that program. Really? When are you guys coming back with a season Maybe two, a, you ooh, know? Should we tease? Maybe a, we're good. We're, part of our meeting this week is to be creative. Yeah, yeah. Good Maybe. luck getting Mark and Terry back on board. <laughs> I no. think we wore them. It was like 20, 20 hour days oh, yeah. for like three straight Killer. weeks. That's just turkey hunting. So yeah. We could, we can, um, we can bring in a new cast, but maybe we do the 10 year anniversary. And, there you uh, go. And, mm. uh, that's not a bad idea. Actually. Not a bad idea. Well, Mitch, you, you bring up you know, money. Money is a part of, of everything here. And some people are like, well, mm. there's, there's too much money involved in hunting now. But yeah. money kind of, I mean, in my mind, kind of correlates with interest. If there's no interest in whatever content, there just won't be any money there. So it's almost like art is imitating life and that we're showing or uh, Outdoor Challenge showing what people are tend to be most interested in. And people tell others that with where they spend their dollars. What they watch. Mm-hmm. Right. Ratings. I mean, that's end of the day. I mean, like you said, you can you can mess with that a little bit by getting a better airtime air on a certain night. I mean, there are certain things that give you better ratings, but in general, if nobody's watching, you're gonna know, right? You're gonna know right. like what what resonates with people, mm-hmm. and that goes back to that they're they're voting with their dollars. You know, you hear that yeah, saying exactly. a lot. That this is also similar in that regard, where they're they're voting with their views. You know, and the other thing that does, it seems like it pushes the media forward, like better cameras, better production, better stories. Like in the end, it's better for everybody. Well, I think back in the day, you know, we were talking about Jeff Wayne, who who you know was was pretty instrumental for a, a long time there at the network. He, you know, he always. Uh, made a big thing about the golden moose awards. Mm -hmm. It was an industry inside show, you know, Mm -hmm. award show in the industry. And, uh, he always said it like it it lifted when that started becoming a thing, it lifted the production value of, of the shows because they, they wanted that notoriety. And we, we haven't done that show, you know, that, that award show went away a few years back and, and, um, 
Yeah, I get it because we did an internal award show for years too here in Drew Outdoors with our team. Had everybody come in and we called the Shoot the Thrill Awards. We did it for years and uh, finally we kind of stopped doing it. And, and you know, because it was outgrowing, <laughs> the cost of it was outgrowing the return, sure. so to speak. And I know the Golden Moose Awards was a similar thing. It was out at Shot Show in Vegas and Vegas. Like pretty it, extravagant. It, it got really extravagant and probably a little too much for our, our industry, you know, honestly. And uh, but but in the heyday it definitely i mean to win you know the the coveted award of the year or you know best this or or that it meant something sure you know as a, with a producer background that i had coming into this job i i was honored to be passed the torch on the golden moose awards and i produced i think the last two maybe three of the shows mm. And we produced them like a like a like a live show. We they televised se- several of them, but I, I loved it. But man, it was not in my job description. Yeah, my whole team that worked on it, it was always just an added thing that we did. Uh, you all used to participate in the judging, and we were very transparent. But we also didn't you know share like the secret sauce necessarily. Yeah. But um, what was disheartening for me over time was as much effort and energy as we put into it. You have 12, 13 categories. You have a limited amount of time you can do it. Uh, certain winners. And, and uh, we tried to do the um, fan voting. Yep. Well, if you, had a, if you had a very active following, you Ted could. Ted Nugent. Uh, <laughs> Roger Raglan, who yeah. I love. You yeah, know, yeah, early yeah. on, Roger yeah. Raglan was able to be you know, a favorite. favorite host, right? Yeah. Because he has, and still to this day, has a very, very rabid, loyal, loyal yeah. highly engaged fan base. When he asked them to go there and vote, yeah. they did, right? Yeah. And Ted was the same way. So, um, I, I, I've, I'm a pretty even keel guy and I, you know, I don't, I didn't, I had nerves. I think the first one, I remember being with my wife at the towel at the nightclub, be, yep. like before the show. And like, I couldn't eat. I mm-hmm. was like, this, this show was about to go off. We were prepared. I loved the script. I loved, I got to pick the, the, you know, who spoke. Yep. I got to kind of create this emotional journey in that show. And I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy, but that was, it was that was good. the goal was of well the year produced. we had when we had Taya Kyle. Yeah. And I had Jana Waller. I got to pick Jana Waller to introduce her friend Taya wow. Kyle to honor, um, you know, Chris Kyle. I mean, that was, I get in goosebumps now. Just oh, thinking, yeah. I was very proud of that, having created that. And then to, you know, to see my producer, you know, customers, but also friends. I, you know, oh, yeah. To a fault, I, I have deep respect for our producers because I've walked in your shoes. Sure. It's not easy. I always tell you, it's never been easy. It's harder now than it ever has been. Um, so I remember um, approaching a producer afterwards who was one of the producers who won a major category, and I'll keep it very generic because I was like, you know, congratulations. That's all, you know, on, on the big win. And it's like, you know, and it, it was. Then the response was, well, yeah, blah. I was like. Are you kidding me? It's like hmm. out of out of you know two hundred producers in the room, they should have been the happiest. Oh yeah, and they still weren't satisfied. And it's like oh. a lot of disgruntled people Can, and, would leave that show every year. Right. <laughs> it's crazy. I want to set the record straight on one that I still hear about, and you you probably know when I start talking about it. It was um, the best turkey, and because it was it, the award went to the Bass Pro Shops. And it was the year that Philip Culpepper shot the turkey with the judge handgun in the face. Yeah, yeah. Creeping Mm. in the, Mm -hmm. what do they call it now? Fanning. Reaping. Reaping, Reaping. right. So that was early on. By the way, so what people, here's the backstory. Everyone, you know, when you watched the clip, it was like amazing. Everybody jumped out of their chairs. five seconds that that you guys showed at the award show. And then you watched the clip of the Bass Pro Shops one where they're driving down a golf course and there's grass blowing in the wind. (laughs) They're like, how the hell did that one win? And I'll tell you how it won. Um, The five minute clip that was submitted was better than the 30 second piece Mm, that were 15 second tease in the theater. And Nate Hosey also submitted the same clip because Nate, I think was the guy down there or whatever, you know, it's like, a, so for the people who judged it, I think there was like, Oh, well I saw that one already. Yeah. So there was some confusion mm. on the judging side of yeah. it, yeah. but we, we did not. And I, I will take it to the grave. We did not, you know, fudge results. We yeah. never picked winners. We never did anything like, it's like, so it won. And it was like, how the hell did that happen? I was like, well, I'll tell you, it, it happened. It was, and by the way, if you saw the whole clip, 
the Bass Pro Clip, it was pretty funny. I mean, yeah. they're driving around the golf course, they're pulling shotguns out of the out of the golf bag, and they're shooting turkeys on the on the the golf course. And I think in that one they missed one, or they you know, it took like three shots. Yeah, they got one killed or something. Yeah, it was about the full five minutes, and that's what you know because we've judged it every year forever with certain categories. If you were in that category, you didn't judge that category, right, but right. we would judge other categories. And mm -hmm. it, I mean, it was you would what you would see and judge versus what was shown in the highlight clip it was two different it was two different stories almost right. and you could see where if that was the first time you saw it as a viewer in the audience you'd be like what the hell how'd that so yeah what <laughs> this you, is rigged what people don't see is like let's say we had 500 submissions for all the categories yeah. that's 500 clips so we had somebody managing that media Jeez. and this is this is back in the like you know yeah, net speeds weren't that as fast yeah. as they are now. Uh, people used to submit hard drives. Yeah. So all of that. And back you'd and forth. send us a CD with the hunts or whatever right. back in the day. And then right. there was a list of criteria and you'd have to check off scale of one to five or one to 10 or whatever. You'd have to check certain right. things off. And so, like I said, it wasn't rigged, but the only thing that, you know, we had a small group and we, we tried to keep like five people that would go through for each category mm -hmm. and break it down to the top 10. And we always had scoring. We had criteria for scoring, and uh, we would always throw out an outlier. Like if you know someone, if if this score's average was you know nine, and somebody get rated at a one because they hate Matt Drury, mm. we you would usually have like we get you, you. I think you got rid of the top one and the bottom one to get in. And so then we would send those top ten. And the idea was you're nominated, and it's an honor to be nominated because there were a lot of submissions. Sure. And then um, yeah, it just became complicated. The show also went from uh, the Hard Rock Hotel, which was a venue as a venue was awesome for, with tables and music. But then it got raided by the uh, the, uh, the porn, porn industry, the porn, industry, the the, porn awards. The last year, the AVN awards. The AVN awards, awards <laughs> meant you know you know Stan Potts meeting you know uh, Debbie does Dallas or whatever. <laughs> made everything. Made dude. some interesting that, that circle bar dynamic. in the middle. Oh yeah. To see, I, I'll never forget that last year. I have photos that are still <laughs> like, staying pretty interesting. I, you would see you know certain outdoor channel hosts and then you know shoulder to shoulder at the bar trying to get a drink with, with a porn star yeah a lot of porn yeah. stars it was so then we moved, <laughs> we moved to the venetian we hated theater. to leave <laughs> really? yeah. the venetian theater was was beautiful classy right but it's hard you're in a line with all your people you can't really bring your advertisers or have a great conversation with them mm -hmm. it just became a, a a big show and um so yeah, and that, that's part of why it went away. Part of it was it was just so much effort and expense, and people just weren't happy. I, yeah. I would love to keep doing it in some, in some way, shape, or form. It's yeah. just um, the juice was not worth the squeeze. Oh, as I, I get say. it. Mm -hmm. Believe me. <clears throat> not to mention the expense, but you know we did yeah. have Donald Trump. Yeah, that last year. year. Yeah, that the, last year was the year he was. Uh, it was two thousand fifteen. It was a, no, a presumptive nominee 16, when he was yeah, 16, so. but you know, January of 16, I think that's what it was. Right. Right? He wasn't elected yet, yeah. he was, uh, but he, had, he was just going to be, he was presumed to be the nominee. And uh, who'd we have for music that year? It was John Fogarty. John I Fogarty. I mean, it was awesome. Wow. That was funny too. So the very short backstory there is we, um, he was in the theater. Right. He had a show in the Venetian theater hmm. that you could go to. Yeah. And so um, we organized, we had the theater reserved. So they were, they were going to be dark that night. We negotiated, I don't remember what the cost was for him to play a three song acoustic set for it. And then like a week before they said, hey, um, would you be OK if he did a full band set? Uh, because it was too much effort to tear down all their gear uh, yeah, yeah. and bring it all back again. And we're like. Yeah, no problem. We'll do that. Same cost. <laughs> Same cost. Yeah, it's Jeez. like how awesome was that? It, it was a very cool experience. Because right. yeah. yeah, that had we also had Blake Shelton with Miranda oh, Lambert yeah. in the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Zach Brown. Yep. Um, we knew we were getting. Um, um, we were onto something when people started ca counterfeiting tickets oh, to yeah. the event. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was a hard ticket good. to come by too. Yeah, so. I mean, we would get. You know, we had three shows in the network, so we would always get an allotment of say ten tickets mm -hmm. or whatever. Sure, but sure. it was uh, it was a hot commodity for a while. Yeah. So, anyways, I, I, before we move on to the question of the day, I, I do have a on the social media side of things. So, how do you guys feel like the Outdoor Channel, Sportsman's Channel, you know, kind of rank in the social media world as far as representation, as far as you know, I because I, I know the the rap you get in the meme world or those 
you know, sure. those, those pages that hit all of us, you know, and, and anybody that's an influencer or producer pretty much gets knocked down in, in, in yeah. one shape or, or, or form. But how do you feel like you guys stack up on the social side and representation and, and, and carrying the torch, you know, cause outdoor channel is considered, especially for the longest time, the leader for our entire industry, mm-hmm. as far as forward facing media it's group, flagship, flagship how do you guys feel like now that social media has kind of taken over, you know, the last five years or whatever, it's kind of the most important thing. Do you feel like the network has kept up and, and are still is a flagship in that regard on social as you are on the, on the TV side or what, what do you think on that end of it? I would say, um, for the network, it's an area that needs development. Yeah. I would say, um, it's been complicated we've had a couple swing and a misses not on the micro scale but just on the on the broader scale i think early on we had some good things going for us you know for it for me personally it's like, you know, a blessing and a curse and or it's a love-hate relationship i love yeah. to hate social media <laughs> yeah. right um I, I it's interesting because you can engage with fans uh, what we struggle with mightily is um is being shadow banned because we have content that promotes hunting or yeah. firearms and, yeah. you know, and, um, it's extremely frustrating because I'm in the field a lot. I mean, with other producers and I get to participate in some pretty cool things. And so very early on, I became a contributor to our social media, mm-hmm. not because I want to be a social media star, but because, but you know, by default, <laughs> I hunted with Will Primos. Yeah. I want to sure. share that with more people because it's like the dream hunt. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, when I would organize a, um, like a, a live early on when the lives were going mm-hmm. on and we didn't, and very early I took my wife fishing and she caught a Goliath grouper. We were with Mark Davis from big water adventures. She caught a 500 pound Goliath oh grouper and we did it live and she got hundreds of thousands of views. You know, a beautiful woman you mentioned out kicking in coverage, catching this fish, but it was yeah. authentic. It was cool. Um, it was very early on. Well, you know, then you go and you do something, something that's, just as cool 2000 views no, no, there's like i remember i did one and i was like it's like wow there's like 15 people watching i was like and Sounds we have a million up. fans on outdoor channel yeah. yeah i was like is is this on did i accidentally go on my personal page <laughs> and it's like i seriously thought that it was like and so like there it just didn't it's it's been frustrating so um I've actually done less of the lives because I'm like, I would rather, if we're going to interview somebody or do something special, I'd rather record it, produce it, produce it, yeah. and, have it and promote it and then drop it because that mm-hmm. the, the luster around doing everything live is, you know, it's, it's, everybody's doing it. So it's definitely an area of growth for us. The meme pages, um, you know, I, I have a sense of humor I, and I'm not afraid to laugh at myself yeah. or our people or yeah. call people yeah. out. It's like the meme pages that are specifically focused on hating our, our everything about, you know, or targeting, you know, young women or the Western hunters, which called the Westies. That's one of the, that's when I, I love, you know, yeah. some of our Western producers, I refer to them as Westies right. to their faces and we sure. love it. Yeah, it's, it's Funny. fun. <laughs> but, but most of them are, you know, that the meme pages, it's just kind of, you know, mean spirited and gross and, you know, and I've explained, uh, you know, we have mutual friends on the, uh, working class bow hunter. Yep. I went on their podcast, one of the very first ones I ever did, because I wanted to talk about, you know, the Bill Buzzbiss and Chris Brackett issue. Yeah. Um, because on a very human level, you know, it, it was really sad. Mm. I can see how somebody from the outside is, you know, good thing that happened to them because they're assholes and they, you know, you know, you know there's a lot of hate and vitriol in that, mm-hmm. but on a personal level, it's like. You know, Bill Buzzbus wants to contribute to his family's deal. People don't understand he's got inoperable brain tumors. Yeah. And that, you know, and so it's not an excuse for what he did, but they don't, Mm -hmm. you know, know, and Chris Brackett, same way. You know, Chris was a changed man before that whole thing came down. Mm-hmm. The, I, I'm not. I'm not saying he was, was filmed. I'm not saying before. he was a Drury. Yeah. You know, by, yeah. by that time, but he was. You know, he was not the same guy that came that that shot those two deer, and not the same guy that berated the camera guy. And so, on a on a very you know human level, I I I, I felt bad for, bad for the guy, mm-hmm. right? And so I went on the onto the. Uh, and the, and the working class bow hunter guys, you know, they had a relationship with Chris and some experiences there, and I, I wanted to kind of uh, clean the air there, but. So, I mean, back to social media, the network, I, like I said, I think it's an area where you'll see us again, like I told you, everything in our business, when someone has an issue or a question with something, mm-hmm. 
there's always something on the outside that's perfect. We could sit here today and conceive the perfect model for social media for the networks. And then it would be like, but remember, I've got 200 producers and they all want promotion. Yeah. And they all want to have promos on there. And guess what happens? When you create a beautiful promo for an episode and you Tanks. put it on there, nobody watches it. No. And then nobody wa- then, then, then the algorithm doesn't push any of your other stuff. Yeah. So why are you putting pictures of a girl you know, kissing a duck? I, you know, I, I, first of all, it's not my department. I don't run it. And maybe, and there are certainly choices that they have made that I yeah. probably wouldn't have. Yeah. But I understand how it, how it happens, right? Yeah, you have to play the game to some degree. Yeah, and, you know, but and, and here's it. I've kind of turned the corner on the on the meme pages and that because you know if you've got twenty five thousand followers and you post something that you know, hey, the network's stupid and they did this, that doesn't that that's the pulse of that community oh, yeah. that they, they of their following exactly that's their 25,000 fans it's agree good with information that. to have right i don't follow them anymore i don't need to because yeah. when something stupid happens yeah. i got five people who send it to me yeah sure. i got one yesterday i got the the uh the uh, dick print in the snow yeah. somebody put, which Tim the, yeah which by the way i had seen that picture before <laughs> and i thought it was funny right and i looked at the comments on it and i'm like okay and everybody thought it was funny and then it goes to one of the meme pages, you know, and they and they just let's see, look, there's, you know, they're, here they go. Sharing they're trash again. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, well, fine, but, and, you know, and it's just like, it's tough. I think you're, you guys are in a tough spot because as a big, you're a big entity, right, in our space, and <clears throat> I don't think you guys can get caught up in the like something that working class might be able to share, we can't share necessarily, or mm-hmm. you can't share mm-hmm. because you're supposed to be ab- above, you're supposed to showcase hunting in a certain light at all times. Right. I think that's the general mentality that, that a lot of people might have, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and we have this conversation internally, how far can you go with humor? Because yeah. the bigger your audience, the less you can get away with. Well, for instance, so <clears throat> one of our guys here, I guess a big thing is putting like arms, like animating arms onto animals or whatever and, and, and making a, you know, a funny meme mm-hmm. out of it or like whatnot. Like a rooster running around with, with, with arms, you know. Arms. And so one of our guys internally, he, he did that and it looks awesome. And it was like we came back from our snow break and that was one of the things he worked on. He showed it to me and like I laughed. And then I thought... Uh, what would Mark think? What would Terry think? Should we share this? Yeah. And so, tough. so then, cause at the end, you know, the, the turkey's like, do, 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 do. he's walking around. He's, he's, he's low. We put, you know, this guy put arms on him and it's funny. Yeah. And then he gets shot. And then there's a debate. Well, do we make it too real? Then he got shot. And it's like, what if we would have cut it right before he got shot? And then there's another one where the turkey's jumping on a decoy and he's beating the crap out of a decoy. It's like, okay, if he doesn't get shot, is it funnier than that way? And then, right. th- you know, we talk internally. It's like, this probably never sees the light of day. Yeah. <laughs> You, you, know, you know what I mean? And those are, so there's an internal um, editorial that happens, right? Where yeah. we go through all these steps and we can do that because we're a small company and it's, you know, when something gets shared that misses, like that we didn't proof or approve and something got shared with, you know, we got a decent sized social team mm-hmm. and say something just got shared that shouldn't have, which happens maybe once or t- twice a year, mm-hmm. but it does happen. And then we'll get a text from Mark and it says, how do you guys let this happen? Mm-hmm. And not and, one of us. Yep, more, off, more often than not, it's a Mark miss. Right. So, so no. th- we're able to edit- editorialize ourselves because we're smaller. But on your scale, I could see where it may be a little bit tougher because it's, it's, it's just a whole different department. I mean, how many employees does the network even have at this point, KSE in right, general? Right. It's, it's a big group. doesn't mean right or wrong, but there's. I think when you're getting the shit about it, it's because of that. It's because people think that you guys should be above it. We should be above it. A mossy oak, a real tr- – you know what I mean? Like there's certain – companies in the industry Mm -hmm. that shouldn't be at that level of, of sharing those types of things. Right. And there's some company, a a Tim Wells, everybody loves him. He could get away with murder basically. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because the guy, that's his persona that he has created over time. And it's different. As a rule of thumb, anytime they post 
or share something of Tim's, <laughs> they should know that uh, that may be problematic. It's so controversial. I, yeah, what I would say is, uh, and I, I I do believe that the network should be that standard barrier. Like, yeah. To the point, like I, I'm with like my son has a um, his first ever deer. It's mounted in his room, and he had a hat on it, and he he probably literally just you know put his hat up yeah. there. I bet and people like, got pissed. No, no, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> but I I looked at it. I thought you know what. Um, Let's and, and I'm not that guy, yeah, like yeah. I'm, but I'm like you know. Let's not disrespect. You know, the the reason we we made that mount was to you know to really respect that animal and yeah. remember the hunt and that. Yeah. So let's not decorate them necessarily. Let's. You know, but I'm not like gonna. I'm not gonna. I, believe me, I get all the viewer feedback from our viewers, and yeah. and you'll. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, you know, there are people that would do that, but like, I think we do have to be that standard barrier. Um, We've, uh, I've talked to my kids about, like, my kids will, will post some videos of, you know, fish and that. Like, you know, you need to be respectful yeah. when you release a fish. You don't, yeah. you don't throw right them. You there. don't do whatever, yeah. you know. It's like, and, and we're all guilty of stuff like that. But it's, um, the, the reason we're probably not there is, is really probably pretty boring. But, yeah, we do have a big business. Um, I would tell you on brands like Guns and Ammo magazine, and that if you look at their social media, I mean that is completely buttoned up and absolutely yeah. perfect, yeah, exactly, exactly what you would expect from yeah. Guns and Ammo. The yeah. networks, um, it's it's been a little bit looser, partly because of how it's been staffed and how it's been managed, yeah. and and I think you'll see some changes coming up here in yeah. 22 on that. I think about even on our end, like we have a young social media team, and sometimes they just. No, to no fault of their own, they don't have the life experience yet to know if this, hey, I thought it was funny. I didn't think it was a big deal. You, you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. goes up or they share it. Right. And, you know, whereas a Mark or a Terry or, you know, it's like, oh, we've, you know, we've been around, I've been here 18 years, I think now. It's like, you, I've, I get all, like you get all the viewer feedback. I get all the viewer feedback from the website. Mm -hmm. And th these guys police all the social media side and Tim sees all the deer cast side. And it's like, you see enough of it. You get a better pulse for what the user at home, the viewer yeah. at home, right. You, you know, what you have to do to try to appease everybody. You're so never going to do it, but you, you sure as hell got to try. Ted Nugent has my cell phone and uh, oh. I know if we've really screwed something up <laughs> and when I, when Ted calls, mm -hmm. uh, because they're generally not short calls and they're generally yeah. one-sided. It's amazing to get berated by get Ted. Spoken to. <laughs> yes. But he, cause he's brilliant. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but like one of the recent posts, not Ted related, but uh, it was a young woman and she was what the, they the mouthing of yeah. the duck. Right. Okay. So and, and by the way, get. well, but, but here's the deal. Like I, I, again, I don't sit on social media and look at, but I saw that picture yeah. came through, and it and it didn't like you know raise fire alarms for me. And I'm a hunter, right? Yeah. It didn't offend me. Okay, here's this, this young girl, and she was not you know in a bikini, right? Mm -hmm. She it was like I looked at her like she could have been my daughter, and yeah. she was clearly participating and having fun yeah. and doing whatever. It wasn't like she was trying to be you know just you know just you know get likes for that. And then that was one that got that targeted and I'm like, you know, I really felt bad for that young woman because she was just out doing what we want her yeah, to do. She's a real person. Yeah, exactly. And they just, they just pound on it. And then the, and then everybody piles on and, they, uh, and I, I was like, man, you know, and then I, I read one comment and it was like, apparently there's disease issues. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I didn't know. But there's also disease issues if you lick your golf ball on the golf course too. <laughs> so, right. And people still licking balls in general is not, 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 not <laughs> encouraged. Let me flag the tape there and make sure we get that audio, please. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Isolate that. Well, you know, you, you mentioned earlier we were talking about getting into the hunting industry and and it, it just struck me that anything you do now exists in perpetuity. So oh, thank God there weren't cameras when I yeah, grew no up. Oh. I, Dude, college would have I would have never had a career. <laughs> All <laughs> I mean, the cheating and chess that you did. Yes, Jeez. yeah. Something like that. <laughs> several <laughs> several events at our house. Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> yeah. Live streamed <laughs> on Twitch yeah. back in the day. We would have live streamed night? anything that I was a part of. <laughs> yes. For but, my in my college it would have been like penis tricks. <laughs> thank God those aren't on film or yeah. on camera. Thank <laughs> God. Yes. Let me Hold show on. you the baked potato later. Hold on. Did we just become best friends? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like if if you want to have any credibility, you have to be very careful about what you do. Not only like as a representative of the hunting and fishing and outdoor community, but just in terms of your own reputation. You know what though? I think if you're a good person and you're authentic and you don't have to Not worry either. about because like I've I've judged talent across our network and one thing it's you know that i like I, you can't always do it but i prefer to work with people who are the same 
off camera mm -hmm. as they are on yeah. camera because all too often you, you can't always do it. You can't be a raging asshole off camera yeah. and a and a bubbly personality um, on camera all the time. At yeah. some point, yeah. it's going to cross mm -hmm. over and uh, people like pick that, up just, on and, and, but, and just be just be authentic, particularly in our genre of entertainment. If you're an actor, that's one thing. We're not actors. We are living our dream and sharing it with the masses, and you know, mm -hmm. and hopefully people are just good people, and 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 that comes across on camera. When I go deer hunting, I am acting, acting like a hunter. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's about it. That's I'm, I'm with you. With. <laughs> well, the barometer seems to be high today. <laughs> Let me check my deer cast. Oh, it says I shouldn't be here. Oh well, <laughs> at least now I have an excuse of why I didn't shoot that deer. <laughs> What what hurts is when it says great <laughs> and you didn't shoot, shoot it's anything. The thing around here, most of the time. Speaking All right. of gimmicky products, let's help someone today. <laughs> let's do it. All right. The question of the day is proudly brought to you by the Sportsman's Channel, your home for Winchester and Jury's natural born and everything red, wild, and blue. I was surprised, but Tim. <laughs> Is all over it. I shouldn't have been surprised. There we go. You are a sponsor of this question of the day. Oh, I don't fantastic. Know if you can do that. Surprise. You can Hooray thank for Monty for that. Hooray for us. Oh, our parade money yes. for this. <laughs> hey guys, this is Tyler Denny from Warrensburg, Missouri. And I would just like your guys' advice and input on how to go about acquiring a hunting lease. I've never done this before, so I don't know how much to offer these farmers for their land to lease or how to come up with a contract. So I would just like to hear what you guys got to say about this so thanks for your advice thanks i'm interested in that too <laughs> so tyler thank you for submitting the question anyone who wants to do that there's a link in the show notes also we'll put the link up in the rack pack every now and again uh just leave us a voicemail and if your show if your question gets used on the show you could receive uh mitch's hat here mm -hmm. deer cast hat mm -hmm. just reach out do to we me. have any of those left Bottom i'll hands? sell them mine yeah mitch's okay <laughs> <laughs> okay so leasing property. This is something that I, I have some experience in. I've been leasing a piece for about eight years now, and I just picked up a new piece this past year. And it can be very difficult to find a lease. And I think that the rub, you know, that, that leasing property gets now is that there are, there's a lot of people out there that w are willing to pay a good amount of money for a lease Whereas it used to be back in the day, you could get handshake, knock on the door, handshake, mm -hmm. and I hunt your property. And those days are, I mean, I'm sure there's Stuff. some some local communities where, you know, that, that that still happens. But in general, that is a rarity anymore. So I think there's a couple of ways to, to, to you got to keep your ear to the ground. And it really helps if you know people in certain areas or, or say even like a, um, uh, real estate agents, you know, for for these types of properties that they seem to find pieces of dirt. I know like Aaron Bennett, who's a good buddy of mine, and, you know, we share a lease together and he, he might come across them at, when he comes across a landowner that's maybe not interested in selling their property. Or, yet, your, but or your game warden, by the yeah, way. Yeah, game, game warden's, warden's a great yeah, one. Great, yeah. uh, as far as what to pay, I mean, I've, I've heard of things as low as 10 bucks an acre. I've heard of, uh, Mark is I, magical somehow. He gets some of his neighbors to, you know, he'll, he'll say he'll pay for the uh, property taxes for the year. Or, you know, the, if turkey you know lease for turkey ground is different than leasing for all hunting or whitetail you know rights i mean there's there's a lot of ways to look at it but i think like in the midwest a good average is a 20 dollars an acre type of a um you know price and some of the more you know say you're close to st louis or close to a, uh, a a city it gets tends to be a little more expensive because there's more the convenience people and convenience and the 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 caliber of of person trying to lease there might be doctors or lawyers yeah. or whatever from those cities Podiatrists. exactly so that might be 30 bucks an acre i mean it's it's not not everything is equal um but <clears throat> i think you know uh, uh, apps like proctologists yeah uh, the really Asp, probably, this is like some of them hunt. the <laughs> second or third podcast we've talked about the ass man for seinfeld <laughs> right <laughs> that's right <laughs> uh so you know i think 
on X apps like that have helped a lot because you can get the information of properties sure. and, and who tax addresses and, and, and things of those natures and be able to write a letter and reach out to them. Cody Thurston, I believe we have a thing and uh, article in Deercast uh, that we can mm -hmm. link up to where Cody Thurston kind of takes you through his process of trying to get lease new leases and acquiring permission yep. using an app like OnX and having a, a letter that he's, you know, kind of constructed and sent out, send a hundred of them out. You might get two people that'll say yes, you know, but, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to go about it, but I know it, it can be a very difficult thing. I mean, it's, that's part of the reason the, the lease that I have that I've had for eight years, uh, you know, some years I'm like, God, this thing, I, I need to get rid of it. It's not producing anymore. It, it, but it's like, man, if I get rid of it, I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the tough part about it. People, once they get them, they tend to keep them for, yeah. for a while. Um, so I, there's a lot of ways to go about it. I, you, you know what I mean? Uh, and a lot of pricing ranges. But I think if you're generally speaking in the tw 10 to $30 range for full hunting rights, that's pretty average. 20, 20 okay. bucks being kind of the standard. And I'm talking Midwest, you know, I, I don't know about other areas of the country. It's just been my experience. Sure. So well, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. I, so I was looking at a lease in South Dakota last year and, um, and I found it online. There's companies that broker leases, yep. right? Hunting lease network. And uh, I found a property over by Rapid City where I loved to turkey hunt in the Black Hills. And there's, you know, of course, the, the listing is, you know, there's mountain lion and there's, you know, it's, well, if there's mountain lion, maybe mm -hmm. I don't want to go there. But there's, it was really cool. And I, so I sent it to a buddy of mine who lives in, in Sturgis area. And he's like, he goes, yeah, if you're a mountain goat, that property is perfect. Like, so, oh. so like, I would have, I would have gone before I ever pulled the trigger yeah. on that thing. Mm -hmm. But he's like, he goes, it's, you know, yes, it's, it's there. It's like three grand or whatever it was the lease. It sounded too good to be true. So it, it's, it's tough if you're going to lease somewhere outside of your own backyard. I've, I've, you've given me some ideas about the taxes. Cause I got, I, I lost hunting property in the Minneapolis area. Cause a woman who I adored was, and used to give her venison. And mm -hmm. she, when I first met her, she's, I asked her if I could bow hunt deer. I said, you know, and I was being all conservative. Like I didn't want to tell her like I'm a natural born killer. It was like, I'm not a sociopath. You I don't just, understand I, how good of a hunter I, I am. I just enjoy hunting with my family. And, and it was five minutes, 10 minutes from our house. Mm. And she's like, and this woman, she's a, a short Jewish woman, dark hair. She's gardening. And she's like, kill them all. I've never <laughs> been able to grow flowers yeah, in this property. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, I won't do that. But she's like, so I got permission. And then, you know, 10 years later, she sold it to her kids. And the kids are like, one's a lawyer. So that's, yeah. that's my question for you as a follow-up on yours is um, because in Minnesota, if you get paid for allowing access to your property, then there's some assumption of liability. But in, in but if if you offer somebody free access to it, there's no liability. So gotcha. like, so now I'm going to go back to her kids, and one of them uh, one of them's married to a lawyer. That's always the problem. There's always a lawyer in the family. Yeah. But I've got to mitigate that risk and just say, really, you know, I'm, I'm only I only want access realistically hunting access access from April 15th to May yeah. 31st, and from September 15th yeah. to December 31st. And if I can have you know, cover the taxes and then, and have liability insurance and, and disclaimers and the, very minimal. I don't know if I can overcome that. Th this is what I uh, you bring up a good point. You can mitigate some of that when it comes to the liability. There's a company called American Hunting Lease Association and they have actual, uh, um, products that they sell products just for this, like yep insurance that's just for and it's to protect the landowner so right. as a leasee you could go and say hey as a leaseor i have a policy that i will pay for and it lists you as the insured right? yeah and, and they don't need to sign anything even cause, exactly cause that could be a little weird as a yeah. landowner like signing anything that someone yeah, yeah. gives right. you yeah so i i think you know that that's a um a good way to mitigate some of those problems mm -hmm. if, if you have to mm -hmm. because you what you find out is if you go to get insurance on something like that your standard, you know, home insurance, like they don't know how to, they may write you something or sure. you might get a policy, but it doesn't actually really cover you for what you need to be covered for. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to look out for. Yep. Just envisioning this little Jewish lady in a garden saying, kill them all. May the lands run red with the blood of my deer. <laughs> so, so she lost two Yorkies to coyotes too. So oh, she was wow. like, Jeez. I said, you mind if I hunt coyotes here? Kill them all. <laughs> that was like her tagline. Kill them all. Kill them all. Wow. Yeah. Sweet. New show. And she loved venison. <laughs> she, I used to bring her venison. She actually called me one time and asked for a venison roast because she had a friend who wanted to do something special. Yeah. With, and she's like, oh, I know a guy. Nice. So I was her venison guy. 
You were the guy. That's, Everybody has a guy. That's right. Who's your venison guy? It's dad. <laughs> it sure as hell ain't me. <laughs> All right. Well, let's hop into the wildlife word. It's brought to you this week by Tracker Off-Road, the rugged power and dependability to get you there and back. Now, ref- when referring to a whitetail, what's a more common term for the phrase osseous cranial appendage? It's another <laughs> word for osseous cranial appendage. Is it A, your face, B, sinus cavity, C, an engorged tick, or D, antlers? We always let the guests go first because I usually yeah. can't figure these Osseous out. Osseous cranial the, the, appendage. The first time I ever saw an engorged tick on a deer was in Texas. You said tick, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Whoa. And uh, tick, T-I-C-K, uh, which oh, was crazy because the thing was the size of like a dime, right? Uh, but I'm not, that, that's not my answer. Okay. You mean like the, the dangles this is, don't work. Okay. <laughs> this is like it wants to be a millionaire. I'm going with D, Mitch. D in antlers. Okay. Mitch has got D. Well. That's going with. Well. Cranial, head. something to do with the head. Appendage, Hedu- appendage sticking out, right? Osseous mm-hmm. is bone. So antlers. Mm-hmm. I didn't know osseous, so I'm going with Boom. Antlers. You guys both win deer cast hats. Boom. No, I, co- I already collected mine. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're in advance. Away it's rigged. Hats. Jeez. Yeah. It's like the Moose <laughs> Awards. Up, it's rigged. <laughs> hey, don't say that. I got like 10 of them out there on the uh, other side. I'll Too sell late. you 10 more of mine. Cats out of the bag. <laughs> All so right. This was a, a long one, but I thought it was pretty uh, pretty interesting. I always yeah, like. Yeah, weren't you saying business. we were probably going to cut it short because Mitch would be a little yeah twenty minutes stale. Yeah. Yeah. I like to talk. I, this, this is what I do all day long. That's why I don't have notes. I don't have to prep for it. Same. I, I talk to you know, everybody all day long about this, and it's 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 not a bad gig. It's it's it. nice when you, uh, earlier we we're talking about kind of being in the industry when your passions align with your vocation. Like that's the right. ideal place to be in life. Right. Right. So, doesn't happen here, enough. Here we are. <laughs> Just think, your dream job and you got it. Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> now live with it. Dream or nightmare? <laughs> mm, you be the judge. Today. Depends <laughs> who's calling. <laughs> uh, so we should say next week is episode number two hundred forty-nine, and we're gonna have somebody on that Mitch knows pretty well. Woo! He's got part a of the family. Comic book name, Laden Force. <sighs> He's one of my favorite people from time. North American, American Whitetail, Whitetail. Yeah. which is a property a entity of um, Outdoor Sportsman yeah. Group. By the way, and I noticed when I walked in the front door, there's a there's a chair, and on the chair is North American Whitetail. Was well, there? That's where it's we get our pre, mail. pre-staged for ladies. Yeah, we were ready for next you. Week. Is that the greatest name in hunting? Those laden horse. It's pretty cool. He lives up by uh, Dad's farm. Yeah. Actually, yeah. not far from there. He's a good guy. I love Layton. Yeah, yeah. It kind of goes back to when you said, like, just be a, gen- a genuine, authentic person, right. and you'll do okay. Yeah. Layton's kind of that. Good dude. I don't know where he finds time to do this, though, because he's, like, one of the busiest guys in our company, too. He publishes, like, three magazines and a yeah. TV show and that. So Yeah. Raises a family. Yeah. Well, we're going to waste his time for an hour. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Layton. <laughs> so sorry. Will you not buy him lunch, too? Yeah, <laughs> no. Right. Planning on it. We're not buying anybody. He anyway. may buy us lunch. <laughs> Perfect. He'll bring big lunch. Here you go, Red Lobster. All, All right. right. Thanks, Thanks for having me. That was fun. We yeah, appreciate you jumping on. Ahead. Thanks for traveling down. Can't can't uh, say enough about the partnership over the years and the friendship. More importantly, been Absolutely. been a good relationship. It's been a few good sushi dinners in Las Vegas. Oh yeah. Room. I've we missed out the last two years. Yeah, yeah it's tough. We're going to make up for it tonight. Yeah, Uh-oh. steakhouse tonight. I picked a bad year to quit drinking. <laughs> mm. Hey, there's never a bad time. All right. But your devotion to denim is on point, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yep. big steaks. Mm. A big steak dinner. That All was right. Great. All right. No, well, not much more to say after we that. We should stop saying things. Okay. More? Can we say some more inside jokes in closing <laughs> so people don't understand the humor? Sure. If you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Right. See you next week. <laughs> Until next time, peace out. Temperatures are going to be dropping. Perfect conditions for the skinny field. Got to focus on those afternoon hunts. Northwest Tree Stand, 5 p.m. It's the easiest decision you'll make this season. Get ahead of your game with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV was brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's.